welcome to Artificiality, where minds meet machines. We founded Artificiality to help people make sense of artificial intelligence. Every week, we publish essays, podcasts, and research to help you be smarter about AI. Please check out all of Artificiality at www.artificiality.world. We're excited to welcome to the podcast Omri Alouche, the VP of Research at Gong, an AI-driven revenue intelligence platform for B2B sales teams. Omri has had a fascinating career journey with a PhD in computational ecology before moving into the world of AI startups. At Gong, Omri leads research into how AI and machine learning can transform the way sales teams operate. In our conversation today, we'll explore Omri's perspective on managing AI research and innovation. We'll discuss Gong's approach to analyzing sales conversations at scale and the challenges of building AI systems that sales reps can trust. Omri will share how Gong aims to empower sales professionals by automating mundane tasks so they can focus on building relationships and thinking strategically. Let's dive into our conversation with Omri Alouche. If you could, could you start off um, by describing your journey? We're sort of fascinated. Uh, your PhD in computational ecology, I believe it was, through to where you are now doing AI research for Gong. Uh, imagine there's a there's a there's a there's an interesting story behind that path of how you got from point A to point B. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I was always intrigued with like problems and various solutions and into solving them. So it was all around like finding interesting problems, interesting unsolved questions. Um, I actually started in the, in the IDF doing algorithmic work uh, and then studied cognitive sciences and biology. But I was fortunate to complete my undergrad studies in two years and then joined uh, um, an ecology lab just as a developer and got into like research and quite interestingly, interestingly, we we got into a very interesting um, uh, problem and phenomena where we saw that the way those models were created was not correctly evaluated, and so I came up with a better way to do the evaluation. Published one paper, uh, which got you know a lot of, of a lot of traction over uh, I think four thousand citations by now. So it's one of the top. Uh, uh, articles in the history of ecology and then I actually realized that it's all about like you know not the, uh, the solution but the way you frame the problem and how you look at that okay we actually studied together um, how to best create nature reserves uh, and in order to do that you need to understand which species you want to preserve and where they can live and in order to do that, you need to do modeling because you can't go to, you know, all areas of the, the country and mark all species over there. And then you start modeling. Okay. And we actually did machine learning before there was, uh, it was called like machine learning. I didn't even realize that I'm doing machine learning because of that. And it was always, what is the problem and how do I get to solve that? So I've been around algorithms for all of my life. Um, then after completing my uh, PhD, um, I worked for, uh, uh, as an algorithm engineer, uh, for a big, uh, uh, um, uh, defense company. And actually, uh, what intrigued me over there was that I was working really hard on big problems that nobody could solve in the world. And, um, for the managers, this was just one line in a very large Gantt of all of the things that need to happen for the customer. And I was um, I was actually quite frustrated by, you know, they promising that I would be able to deliver on things that I didn't know how I'm going to solve them. And they actually told me, it will be fine. You will solve this with time. Um, and then I started thinking not just about just the problems, but actually how do you manage research? How do you manage innovation? How do you... Uh, keep people innovating and keep people delivering and solving things where you can, you, you don't wait for the eureka moment and then you start working with things, but you plan and you act accordingly, which was fascinating to me. So I actually ended up uh, um, uh, starting a startup 
founding a startup as a sole founder, not an experience I would recommend to to many others, Uh, but a great opportunity for me to make all of the potential mistakes and then add some. Uh, So for me, it's always been like a learning experience. And when I uh, when I sold the, the startup and tried started to look for my next adventure, I talked to like various people and they kept. I, I saw that all of them are kind of like become data scientists. This was 2016, 20 like 15. Uh, it wasn't like a big buzzword. I actually asked them what is that, and they said that's something you've done, you've been doing all your life, but never called yourself that way. You look at data. But you're being very critical about that. You understand the data, you build a model, you understand the world better with that. It's kind of like the entire scientific uh, raising that you had is born into those things. So I joined Gong pretty early on um, as one of the first employees. Uh, and soon after, I started managing the data science team here. Uh, Gong is, is an AI first company, so it's really core to what we do. And uh, go with the company. Uh, up until recently, I managed Gong's uh, AI division, and now I'm Gong's chief scientist. But it's always been what are very cool problems that we can solve with, you know, research, science, and technology, and how do we do that in a way that is predictable, manageable, and 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 uh, actually delivers a lot of value to customers. So, what are the what are the intriguing problems that you're trying to solve now, you know, as chief scientist? I don't know if that's different from what it was when you were managing the team before, but what, what, what are the problems that have, that have captured your attention and imagination today? Yeah, so what, maybe I will start with just describing briefly what sure. Gong does so to give some context about the conversation. So Gong is an AI platform that uh, transforms revenue organizations. There are a lot of companies doing like sales online to other companies mostly. Um, and this involves a lot of like human interactions and conversations. We learned that in order to actually, you know, be able to sell, you need to identify the pain of the other side. You need to identify the decision makers. You need to understand how decisions are made and what value you can actually create. And this involves a lot of conversations, a lot of interactions, emails, etc. cetera. Um, and in the past, this was done completely based on like opinions. Okay, You join a company as a salesperson, you wouldn't know what you need to do. They would maybe introduce you to the product, but you, um, you would go out and just start in having conversations and with Gong, you're able to actually take a, take a, a sales conversation and understand what's going on there and how you can improve in the way that you do, uh, you manage those conversations. So we provide guidance and automation, both to sellers and to leaders, understanding, for example, uh, should you talk about your competition and how? What are the top questions customers ask about? What do they care most about? Uh, how can you help your team be better? How do you coach them? How do you mentor them? What are the changes in the market and and how should you respond to those things? There's uh, plenty of data around. What Gong does is help teams uh, be able to better make sense out of all of the data interactions that they have. So... You know, uh, as an example, we can have a conversation with that's an hour long, but with Gong, you'd be able to understand who spoke when, and if that's a good balance of conversation, what were the topics and the transcripts? Um, did we discuss pricing? Did you raise any objections? Are we actually talking to the right people, the right decision makers and all of those things? And then we can act based on them. And obviously, there's a lot of automation that can be done in all of those things and like processes. So we kind of look at that always as like autonomous driving, like five levels of uh, autonomous driving. Um, And in the beginning, we can like show you where things are at, just give you an ability to view, to review the, the, the drive, listen to the call again. And then we are able to identify the interesting elements and tell you, okay, this is a point where there was an interesting discussion. 
this was a question that you didn't really um, uh, re reply to you properly. Uh, but then we're able to actually help you, you know, make better, uh, uh, better way and, and navigate better the, the, uh, the deal by understanding where you want to get to and where you are in that. And obviously, recently, Gen AI is like completely transforming what can be done in those aspects. So um, in Gone, we are seeing this transformation where we're always being an AI first company, trying to bridge the gap between what can be done and what people actually, and, and what can't be done and understand that there is something that would bring value and can be solved with technology. It can be AI or some other way. Um, but a lot of the work that I do these days is kind of like try to see how far we can take an AI and how do we actually make the best use of that? Where are the capabilities and, and where you can actually count on those things? I can give you like one example. We have a feature where you can go into a call or even a, a business opportunity and you can ask any question that you want. Now, from a technology standpoint, it's not that difficult in a sense because you could do something like that by actually taking all of the data that you have and put that into GPT, chat GPT, and ask the question, get a response. It will generate a response. When we do that, we see that uh, in some cases it provides great responses, but in many it does not. Okay, And people actually f ask things that are challenging, like, what do I need to do to win this sales opportunity, to win this deal? Okay, So if you ask naively ChatGPT how to do that, it fails. But if you are able to identify the important factors for a human, if you are able to teach the model and train the model on what actually happens in successful deals, if you can take the data that you have, that we have in Gone from over 4,000 customers, in what actually works and what doesn't work, then it can learn and we can use that incredible brain that was trained to actually provide a lot of value to customers. So for us, a lot of the research is kind of like to understand what are the boundaries of what can be done now, what will be the boundaries of what can be, which we will be able to do in a year or so, and how we're actually going into, you know, always leading the way into um, into uh, empowering the, the, the various tasks that people do and how that changes the way that uh, business are done. It seems to me that there's a, a, a core tension in, in these kinds of you know these kinds of products where um, you want to support human decision making um, but at the same time there's a there's there is a surveillance aspect you're gathering data from interactions how do you support the 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 individual sense of agency what's that process of of giving people um, sort of more empowered decision making as opposed to sort of prescriptive decision making how do you resolve that how do you manage that tension yeah great question so I think it, it all starts with a basic understanding of like the limitations of AI and machine learning. So Kong is not used to actually making decisions on your behalf. It's kind of like a flashlight that you can point and use that to actually ask the questions and understand what, um, how you can help people improve based on those things. Um, in the very early days, when the company started 2015, 2016, it wasn't obvious for uh, that people would actually want to be recorded. Uh, but that's quite surprisingly not a like, limitation. People understand, especially like young people these days, that this is a, actually a tool that can help them, you know, uh, improve and be better. You prefer to learn what you need to do to improve by, you know, showing other interaction than learning after a year that you didn't um, maybe uh, do so well in the things that you, you're trying to achieve. Um, I think that a lot of like what we're trying to do is actually take the, the side of supporting and empowering, understanding what you want to do and not say, 
let us take the driving seat, but actually say, how can we help you? How can we assist you in all of those things? Um, and that's generally like a good pattern for AI adoption where you're saying, okay, we're, we're not taken over because it's not good enough in those cases, but let us try to see how we can, you know, try to make all of those, a lot of uh, um, the, uh, challenging tasks that you need to do as a person simpler. So if we're having a conversation and I need to take notes about the action items, I'm not as focused as I can be in what you're saying. But if Kong takes those notes for, for me and the action items, and I know that the call is recorded and it's summarized for me, um, then, then it's much easier for me to focus on what actually is going in the conversation. Um, and then, you know, if I forgot to send the email, which is kind of obvious because maybe I just had a follow-up call right after that and you know i've i had uh, some some uh, some emergency that i needed to cater for gone would remind me of doing that and when it would remind me it would even offer to write the email for me but when doing that it would actually always explain to me why those things were created so in a sense it would show me these were the action items and so this is the email that we suggest that you send Okay, you've discussed these topics, so this is why we're suggesting that you do that. So it's not like, you know, we uh, send the email and sign the contract for you, but it's always how would you like us to, like, help you and empower you in those things. I want to go back to something you said before, which was part of your role is um, considering what's possible today and what's possible, you know, in a year or some longer period of time. I can't remember exactly what the different ones are, but I'm curious what, what you say is that it has the answer to that. You know, what, what, what is possible today, especially the, the world for Gong has changed quite a lot in terms of the technical possibilities in the AI space, right? When, you, when Gong was started, generative AI wasn't a thing. I mean, it was a transformer paper, I guess, had been published. No, I can't remember. 2017, so not long after. But the, 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 the world of AI has changed dramatically since, since you started. And so the possibilities of what you can use AI for has expanded. But I'm really also curious to see what you think of in terms of looking forward, right? One of the things that's been... Um, uh, sort of pervasive in our world of, of being involved in the AI space for quite some time is the speed of change is, it feels to be accelerating. And I would imagine that makes your, your role of trying to figure out what will be possible that much more difficult. Um, in a sense, yeah, but I can also argue that it actually makes it simpler because I can think of like the craziest idea and then it will happen with the current pace, current pace of, uh, of events. Um, a, lot of, a lot has changed. I think that maybe one of the topics that is sometimes overlooked is not from like the AI capabilities, but in terms of our the, what humans expect AI to do and how... People are willing to give AI, um, you know, actual control. And, and we briefly touched upon that previously. In the beginning, there was a lot of hesitation about how you actually make recommendations with AI. You need to explain them. You need to be very obvious about those, you know, being based on specific data. You need to actually uh, let people decide if they want to see those or not. Right now, it's it's quite amazing how fast people are saying, you guys have AI, right? Why do I need to do that myself? Can, can we let AI take care of all of those things for me? Um, it's, it's moving much faster than I would anticipate. And people know that it's not perfect, but they're kind of like judging it based on kind of, do I want to spend my time doing those things or do I prefer to let AI do it? And so in many cases, People are willing to let AI be the driver and them being, you know, the co-pilot instead of like the other way around. So a lot of times it's not, I would write the code and you would like assist me. It's kind of like you would write the code and I would, you know, give you uh, guidelines and help you form that. 
um, which is quite interesting. Maybe at a higher level, we're definitely seeing with Gen AI the movement from a community of creators to curators, where we used to be the creator self doing the cre- creative work and writing all of those things. And right now, it's more like AI generated those three different versions for me. And I'm curating and choosing how I stitch them together into something that I can use or making small edits. So that's definitely something that we're seeing and we're trying to see how far we can go with that and how to best do that. Because it's when you're building AI product, a lot of that is about gaining the user's trust. Okay, And you need to be very open about what you can do and can't do. I think that many companies get this wrong and they're saying, oh, our AI is so smart, it can do this and that. And you see a beautiful demo. But then you actually experiment with uh, uh, the product and it's not living up to the promise. And what actually works better is that you're you're being very open about what AI, what it can do, what it cannot do, what you think it will be able to do. And then people kind of accept that and learn how to make the best use of that and, and, and utilize that. I'm curious about, because you have a, you know, you have such an interesting background of, of, um, kind of straddling both humans and machines and, and, and other life systems. Take, a, take this example of moving from creation to curation, and I'm going to make a big assumption here, which is that people who are learning and coming up from more junior positions and developing their expertise, that the creation step is actually a precursor to being a good curator. And if you don't actually do the creation, you don't actually learn and build an intuition for what you're creating and how you create things, um, how good can you be as a curator? Does it make you over-trust the AI? What are you seeing empirically in, in that sort of situation? It's a great point. Um, I think that generally this is what really sets us apart as humans still. okay, We're able to not just learn from those different examples and come up with something that's unique but is based on tracing to things that were done, but it's kind of like completely way off uh, in a sense. Uh, kind of like the Picasso or the Frosberry back, uh, backflip uh, jump, okay, which is like completely different. You don't really see that. Um, but I think that in many of those cases, we as humans have limited ability to like experiment and we are trying to see how we bring our own touch into things. Okay, so... It really helps a lot if I need to write an email and I get some ideas about, you know, I I know that I want to make like a reference how sales is like, you know, how uh, uh, managing, winning a large sales deal is kind of like winning the Super Bowl. Okay. Given the limited time that I have, I would probably say, sit on that for like five minutes. I don't have a good image. Um, I would move on and try to do something else. But Gen AI allows you so quickly to come up with ideas and, and test them and try them and see how they work that it really, in a sense, changes the, the, the process. Now, I need to be able to write some of those things myself. I, I, I totally agree to that. Okay, But a lot of that, you know, if I'm starting, if, if I want to become a writer, then I need to do two things Okay. One is to write a lot and the other is to read a lot. Okay, And by doing both of those to, those things together and always learning from the other side and take that, take what I write, read from others internally and understand the difficulties in my writing and then see how others solve that, then I'm able to learn. So I think that we can, with Gen AI, make, you know, make this dance work better for both, uh, for both of those steps simultaneously. You talk about trust, um, which is one of our obsessions, is understanding how we trust or don't trust machines, and especially generative AI. It's 
you know, top of mind now because everybody's heard about hallucinations and the some level of error rate, which is part of the system itself. It's a predictive system. It's going to have, it operates on probabilities. It's, that's the way these things work. You're operating in a world where the individual um, uh, needs to figure out a level of trust of the system, the system saying, hey, uh, you might want to try this in order to be able to close the deal. Um, it, it, the organization, the overall customer, has to be able to trust that the advice that's being given to the individual is going to be accurate enough or and or the person is going to be able to be skeptical enough to find the errors so that you know it we don't run into more problems like happen in the news right now air canada got um got into trouble because they had a chat bot that gave a traveler um bad advice about how to get recompensated for uh, bereavement leave travel and um it it apparently gave some advice that someone screenshot it and it's and it told him that he could get refunded as long as he did X Y Z, which was out of policy and not accurate. But then the small claims court has said, "Well, you're you're obligated because this is what the tool said to the person." Um, so you're in this world that is, you know, the individual wants to be able to make their make the deal, you know, for their own accomplishment. The organization wants to make sure they make the deal, and they want to make sure that they're doing it all in a way that's responsible, right? That that the deal is actually what the, you want the deal to be. So you're dealing in a very high requirement for trust. And I'm curious how you think about that from a technical perspective of how do you think about what these tools are generating through to how do you design and present the recommendations to individuals that they know a level, the accurate level of trust to give in the system? Sure. Um, I can attest that it's a major challenge, and I think that's one of the places where Gone excels by gaining the trust and, and actually letting people be confident enough in, in trusting the, the AI. Um, in order to actually do that, we, we usually would start with um, being pretty open about like what the AI does okay, and how well it performs. So there's a lot of work that we do internally to ensure the quality, okay? It's very easy okay, to feed um, a call into ChatGPT, ask the, uh, the model to summarize the call for you and give it to people, okay? And in, it, it would read beautifully, but if you were on the call and you know what you care about, you would start spotting places where it's not really being accurate. And... Internally, we spent a lot of effort into making sure that it meets our high bar of quality so people can actually, you know, trust this and see how this works. If you look at scientific papers, and there is a number over there, kind of like how accurate the model was, you know, usually on a grade from like zero to 100. In the industry, what actually is more important is how embarrassing your mistakes are. Okay, so a model of like 70 can be better than a model of 85 because it's actually less confident about things that you as a human would not be sure about and it's not making embarrassing mistakes. So we actually spend a lot of effort into understanding where we actually where it's important for the us for the model to be right. And if the model is not really sure, in many cases you can choose how you would want these. Okay, so we give you the opportunity, for example, to only get the uh, uh, next steps that are we're 100% sure that they are next steps and you need to follow on them, or maybe get, you know, like more, uh, more items that can have some errors in them, but it's important to you that we cover all of the cases, for example. So by even giving you this simple decision, you're more in control and we can better fit your use case and what you care about, okay, and how you actually look at those things and, and measure them. Um, whenever you're working in Gong about like a certain model and, and, and in Gong we allow, we have a feature, a uh, pretty unique and cool feature called Smart Trackers where we actually completely democratizing uh, the, the NLP text classification and say that you know what you care about, so why don't you be the data scientist and, and build a model? We'll show you some examples from actual conversations 
You let us know if this is something that you want the model to capture or no. So you kind of label the data. And after a few rounds of that, we actually build a machine learning model for you. Okay? So, but when we do that, we need to be very open about how good your model is. And we actually show you real world results of the model. And so you can decide, am I happy with what I get? Do I trust the model right now? Do I want to continue training the model and improve that? Or, you know, maybe that's not really getting to where I want. So I think that a lot of transparency is, is key to doing those things and being pretty open about uh, uh, how those things work out. We, we think a lot about that issue of embarrassment. And um, we actually, you know, we talk about it a lot with, with um, when we're running workshops and what have you, which is to, to focus on that as being the measure. Because, um, one, people understand what it is, and two, you never forget it once you've been embarrassed by making a mistake off the back of chat GPT. And it, 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 is a, it is a better way to think about reliability and trust, which is if you have to back off the, the accuracy of the model just to make sure that the human knows to step in. I think that's part of thinking. I mean, that, that's an obvious place to go if you, if you are thinking in sort of five levels of autonomy, if you're thinking about um, the way a self-driving car works. You know, you want to, to, to make sure that the, the human knows and is able and prepared to step in. So driver assist, if you like, being more um, reliable. When you, when you think about um, how this evolves – and what the next sort of step is, the next um, breakthrough. Do you think about um, uh, more cause and effect reasoning support? Do you think about more um, uh, sort of personal growth and coaching? Do you think about um, development of expertise? What What are the, the ways that you conceptualize how AI can make us better thinkers and better decision makers? Uh, I think that all of the above, but I think that one of like the, the, the key things that the people want is to focus on the things that we as humans are good at and take a lot of like the mundane tasks. The interesting thing is that the definition of what's mundane is like being expanded because Gen AI can do so much these days. Um, so in the beginning, uh, like what usually worked for me was trying to uh, find a correlate between the, uh, the LLM uh, level and the age of people with the same like mentalic ability capabilities. When GPT three was out, it's kind of like it was around like my three and a half year old kid at the time. Okay, right now, I would say that it's, you know, in many cases, I'm like a college education. And sometimes it's very, very smart, but it knows, doesn't know enough about your own domain, your own problem, and what's good and what's bad and like for you and how you actually um, work around, er, around that. So I think that for us, we're trying to always see what AI can do based on like an analysis of what how does your day look like? What do you do as a person? Okay, we're actually sitting down as a standard product practice for understanding the pains of the customers. What do they do? Why do they do that? When do they send the email? Why do they send the email? How do they write the email? What's over there? And then try to understand if AI can replace that. And we see that in many cases... Okay. What humans need to do is kind of like be the, uh, the strategist and decide, okay, who am I actually going to talk to? How do I get them into doing all of those things? How do I walk around all of those like complex human interactions? And how do I actually build the rapport and, and connection? The interesting thing about sales is, and, and the, the domain called inside sales where we're communicating over zoom over a large number of conversations is that people don't buy features and don't buy products okay they also they build they buy the trust and the personal relationship they buy from a company where they that they trust 
would provide them with like real value, would build what they need. They uh, trust the other person on the other side. There was uh, a gone research, for example, that um, did an analysis of over 1 million sales calls and found out that when people curse, the, the likelihood of closing the deal increases. Okay. And obviously, if you're thinking about cause and effect, I'm not saying that the next time you go on a sales call, you need to curse, but it actually works the other way around. When you feel comfortable in a conversation with a prospect, okay, then the deal is more likely to close and you're more likely to curse because you're feeling, you know, there's a, there's a friendship, almost a friendship-like relationship. It's, it's interesting to look at those things by... By, by, by the way, one of the early analysis analyzers of, of Gong at the time was actually looking at how uh, women and men sell, sell. Um, and there were, you know, not very significant but interesting differences. Um, women actually sell better than men, um, but they don't really follow the rules of sales that much, because what the study sh- has shown is that women actually. Um, listen better to the other side and are more focused on understanding the, 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 the pain and needs. And then they can cater when they're talking about the solution. It's not just the list of like the features, but actually how we can solve the problems and, 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 and pains of the other side. But I think that uh, those things are more kind of like, you know, popular science uh, uh, and uh, just uh, uh, picanteria. And, and not something that you would see like across the board. How do you find um, analyzing beyond uh, gender, but also um, cultural um, differences in different, um, you know, different regions or communities, different works and language? How do you manage the, well, first of all, I, w- I would imagine that there is differences in terms of effective selling techniques based on different cultures and languages. Tell me if I'm wrong there, if, I, if I'm off base. But if I'm right, how do, you, how do you work with that in your research? And how do you think about providing the right answer to an individual based on their cultural background and the, you know, the person they're talking to and their background? Yeah, um, it's, it's super interesting Quite surprising to me, there aren't a lot of like large cultural differences in many of those aspects. Um, I think that a large part of this is that I need to bond with you. We need to build a connection. Okay. But in all of those cases, um, it's not about the social, cultural um, ceremonies, but it's more about actually us like, connecting and, 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 and me understanding how I can help you. And we work together to solve those things. So, for example, I'm Israeli and we're, you know, shooting straight, uh, not a lot of like, uh, sugar coating, full of those things. And, you know, I, uh, I'm like, my wife is very happy that we have ChatGPT right now. And when she sends an email to, you know, uh, Customers in North America, she knows how to write her basic email, and then it writes it in more, you know, uh, polite business uh, 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 process. But still, what is important in all of those things is not the small things of like it's you know interesting or not interesting. In many conversations, when we have a sale call, if the customer is saying, "Oh, that's very interesting," they're not going to buy because if you are going to spend your money. You want to know that it's going to work for your specific use cases with all the differences, difficulties that you have. And so you're going to ask difficult questions and you want to ensure all of those things work. So we do see that people are, you know, like nicer in some cultures, more polite. The general sentiment is more positive. But in order to actually close the deal, you need the same thing. You need to identify the pain. You need to understand who's the decision maker. You need to understand how all of those things work. There are small differences. In France, for example, a director is uh, more senior than a VP. Okay, so if you're building a system that kind of like understands who you need to talk to, you need to take this into account. But uh, quite surprising for me, and we see this in Gong, we actually have managers that manage people in languages that 
have conversation in languages that don't, they don't understand. And they use Gong to get those calls recorded, transcribed, and then they can ask questions about how the call went or get a summary of the call in English when the call was in a completely different language. And they actually can work with those people to you know, understand how to win the deal and how to, uh, to, to navigate their own challenges. So it's actually quite uh, surprising. There isn't a lot of diff- cultural difference uh, in the way we see conversations being held. Thanks so much for joining us. This has been a great conversation, and um, we're really glad you joined us. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.